Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and a very warm welcome to you on behalf of the High Commission of India and the Policy Research Institute of Bangladesh. Ladies and gentlemen, may I kindly request you to stand when, the, when our esteemed guests, ladies and gentlemen, may I kindly request you to stand to welcome our esteemed guests on the dais. Please welcome the Minister of Finance and Corporate Affairs of India, His Excellency Mr. Arun Jaitley. The Finance Minister of Bangladesh, His Excellency Mr. Abul Mal Abdul Mohit. High Commissioner of India to Bangladesh, His Excellency Mr. Harsh Vardhan Shringla. Mr. B. Sriram, Managing Director of the State Bank of India. Mr. David Ruskina, Managing Director of the Exim Bank of India, and Mr. Zaidi Sattar, Chairman, Policy Research Institute of Bangladesh. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, request all of you to be seated, please. May I now request the High Commissioner of India to Bangladesh, His Excellency, Mr. Harsh Vardhan Shingla, to deliver the welcome remarks. Sir. Namaskar, Shubho Shakal, good morning. It gives me very great pleasure to welcome you to this special event organized by the High Commission of India in association with the Policy Research Institute of Bangladesh. At the very outset, let me say what an honor and privilege it is to welcome the Minister of Finance and Corporate Affairs of India, His Excellency, Mr. Arun Jaitley, who is on his first official visit to Bangladesh. I thank the Honorable Minister for graciously agreeing to deliver a talk on the macroeconomic initiatives of the Government of India today. As the architect of the Government of India's transformational economic initiatives, we would be greatly privileged to listen to him. And his experiences in steering these initiatives through first hand. As many of you would know, His, His Excellency, Mr. Arun Jaitley, Union Minister of Finance and Corporate Affairs, is also leader of the Rajya Sabha, the upper house of the Indian Parliament. He has earlier been Minister of Defense, Information and Broadcasting, Law, Justice and Company Affairs, and Commerce and Industry in the Government of India. He is a lawyer and prominent leader of the ruling Bharatiya Janata Party, the BJP. In his illustrious career as a lawyer, he was designated as Senior Advocate in 1989 and has made significant contributions in the areas of economic liberalization and legal reform. The minister is a recipient of several distinctions, including Dr. Honoris Causa for outstanding performance, both in academics and extracurricular activities. He was selected for the Outstanding Parliamentarian Award in 2010. He is an avid writer on contemporary legal political issues and has written extensively in newspapers and periodicals. As the Finance Minister of India, he has been instrumental in implementing the economic reform initiatives of the government, such as the Goods and Services Tax and the Insolvency and Bankruptcy Code. Under his leadership, the Finance Ministry has intensified the crackdown on black money successfully controlled inflation, which was in double digits earlier, liberalized the foreign direct investment policy by abolishing the Foreign Investment Promotion Board, and has moved forward to achieve government's objective of fiscal consolidation. He has also overseen a number of procedural reforms in budgeting, such as the integration of the railway budget with the union budget, 
advancing the date of the union budget to 1st February, which has allowed for operationalization of new schemes and projects right from the beginning of the financial year, and elimination of the classification of expenditure into plan and non-plan, which will facilitate optimal allocation of resources. I take this opportunity to welcome the Honorable Minister of Finance of Bangladesh, His Excellency Mr. Abul Mal Abdul Mohit, who has been an inspiration and a great support for India-Bangladesh relations. Earlier today, the two finance ministers held consultations on the status of our bilateral economic cooperation. They witnessed the signing of the landmark credit line agreement for the third line of credit of US dollars 4.5 billion extended by India to Bangladesh and which was announced during the visit of the Prime Minister of Bangladesh, Sheikh Hasina, to India in April this year. I would like to welcome the ministers of the government of Bangladesh who have graced us with their presence today, advisors to the Prime Minister, Governor and Deputy Governor of the Bangladesh Bank, my fellow ambassadors, representatives of the diplomatic corps, representatives of international organizations, think tanks, civil society, editors, and of course, leaders of industry and business leaders who are present here. I extend a warm welcome to members of the Indian delegation accompanying the Honorable Minister, Mr. Subhash Chandra Garg, Secretary, Department of Economic Affairs, the Ministry of Finance, Government of India, and the 25-member strong high-level business delegation who has accompanied our minister and who has had very, very intensive interactions and engagement with Bangladesh industry. I also welcome the Managing Director of the State Bank of India, Mr. Sriram, and Managing Director of the Exim Bank of India, Mr. David Raskina. I thank the Policy Research Institute of Bangladesh, represented here by its chairman, Mr. Zaidi Sattar, for partnering us in hosting this prestigious event. A special word of thanks to the State Bank of India, particularly to the Bangladesh country head, Sri Abhijit Bhattacharya, and his officers for not only partnering with us in the task of issuing over a million visas a year, but also for putting together some of the challenging aspects of this morning's program. A word of thanks to our MC for this uh, morning, Srimati Juma Datta, who is on loan from the State Bank of India. Uh, my colleagues uh, in the High Commission of India, uh, led by Srimati Zina, Jina Uika, have also worked very hard to put this event together, and my special thanks to them. With the deepening of economic engagements between India and Bangladesh, the sharing of Indian experiences of new economic reform initiatives with the Government of India aimed at promoting transparency and ease of doing business will have some relevance, we believe, for Bangladesh as well. We look forward to hearing about these in initiatives directly from our Honorable Minister. I once again welcome you. Ami Apnadesh Shabai ke dhanavad janachi. Namaskar. Thank you very much. Thank you, His Excellency. We move on to the launch of cashless visa services introduced by the State Bank of India on behalf of the High Commission of India. As you are aware, the Government of India has taken a host of measures to promote a cashless economy in India. These include the Bharat Interface for Money, more popularly known as the Bheem application, Lucky Grahak Yojana, Digidhan Vyapar Yojana, incentives for digital payments for transitioning into a cashless economy. In keeping with these measures, the High Commission of India has also introduced a cashless visa system. This is being implemented by the State Bank of India by using mobile banking technology and other available platforms. It is expected to bring in greater efficiency and increase the convenience of visa applicants. The initiative is particularly noteworthy because of the volumes involved. The High Commission of India in Bangladesh is the largest visa-issuing Indian mission in the world. This year, the number of visa issued by the High Commission is likely to be in the range of 1.4 million 
representing a 50% increase over the previous year. I now call upon the Managing Director of State Bank of India, Mr. B. Sriram, to briefly speak on SBI's efforts in achieving the Digital India Initiative of the Government of India. Sir. <coughs> Good morning. Uh, His Excellency, Honorable Finance Minister of India, Mr. Arun Jaitley. Honorable Finance Minister of Bangladesh, Mr. Abul Mal Abdul Mohit, His Excellency, the Indian High Commissioner to Bangladesh, Mr. Harshwardhan Singla, other dignitaries present on this occasion, ladies and gentlemen. It's indeed a proud privilege for me to be here at this function, and I thank the High Commissioner of India for giving me an opportunity to represent State Bank of India on this very special occasion. As this august audience may be aware, the Government of India, under the able guidance and leadership of our Honorable Finance Minister, Sri Arun Jaitley, has revolutionized this financial system through the Digital India Initiatives. India is now digitally integrated with state-of-the-art technology that provides a safe, secure, convenient, easy-to-use, cashless, round-the-clock environment to meet the financial needs of its citizens. Over the last three years, we have been through an economic metamorphosis with initiatives such as the Pradhan Mantri Jandan Yojana, which focused on uh, financial inclusion, the social initiatives relating to insurance, such as the Pradhan Mantri Suraksha Bhima Yojana, the Pradhan Mantri Jeevan Jyoti Bhima Yojana, and the direct benefit transfer scheme that has worked towards bringing transparency into the system, reducing leakages, apart from giving considerable control on expenditure and cash management. I am proud to say that as the premier bank of the country, State Bank of India has always been on the forefront to take every national call and creating launch pad for pushing the digital initiatives on a very large scale. The strategy of the bank, keeping in view the inherent limitations of the lower strata, has been to develop a sustainable, secure, low-cost acceptance infrastructure for different payment channels. The bank has introduced a wide array of new digital products, like State Bank Buddy, the bank's innovative mobile wallet, unique ID-based merchant payment products like Bheem Aadhaar, QR code-based acceptance like Bharat QR, unified merchant payment interfaces, the SBI Mingle, which is the social banking application on social pla uh, media platforms. We have also opened more than 250, what we call the SBI in touch branches, the futuristic digital branch, the first of which was inaugurated by our own finance minister, about three years ago. If I were to share a few numbers uh, with you as regards to SBI, and uh, as we have at least 25% uh, market share, you can uh, convert it to the system uh, numbers as well. The Jandan accounts that are opened by SBI is close to 97 million, and uh, an amount of rupees 139 billion has come into these accounts, averaging about 14,000 an account. The DBT transactions, number 390 million up to August, which amount to about 513 billion rupees. SBI has almost 266 million active debit cards. Over 5.12 million credit card color clients average monthly spend of 6,000 crores. The contribution of alternate channels in total financial transactions is now close to 78%. And 40% of these financial transactions are completely digital. More than a million trans uh, merchants have been acquired on point of sales terminals and other digital modes, the highest in the country. Over 600,000 point of sale terminals have been deployed, which handle about 1.2 million transactions, aggregating 2.9 billion rupees per day. 
SBI's internet banking handles on an average four and a half million transactions, aggregating 250 billion rupees per day. One million transactions are transacted on mobile banking as well every day. These numbers are growing every day as the awareness of benefits of digitization percolates through the country and with the government's in initiatives on digital, I'm sure that as we go into the next year, the digital uh, awareness and the digital transactions in countries will grow manifold. State Bank of India has been partnering with the High Commission of India since 2005 on the IVAC, that is the India Visa Application Centers, and currently manages 12 IVACs in Bangladesh and handles about 6,000 applications daily. This is an additional value-add service that we carry on behalf of the Government of India, apart from offering the entire basket of our services as a commercial bank operating in Bangladesh. To further ease, of, to further ease conduct of the transactions, the High Commission of Bangladesh has decided to make the IVACs cashless, and we are indeed very proud to facilitate this unique initiative. The visa applicants will be able to pay the fees in a cashless manner from any location that is backed by the required infrastructure to enable secure payment of free from the applicants. Also, as part of our new initiatives in Bangladesh, we have launched the State Bank Foreign Travel Card in 2016 to obviate the hassles of carrying currency. On this occasion, I would also request all our Bangladeshi friends to carry State Bank Travel Card during their visits to India and other foreign countries and utilize the, the vast ATM and point of sales network that I mentioned earlier. Finally, on behalf of our Bangladesh operations, I assure you that we are committed to making this initiative of the High Commission a very big success. We have taken all necessary steps to make the process safe and seamless and ensure a pleasant experience for all visa applicants. Thank you for giving us this opportunity to partner, and I wish the launch all success. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Those were some enormous figures and varied products that SBI has launched as their technology initiatives. Uh, before I proceed, I request the media personnel to please go back and take the podium, the designate place for them, because the people behind you are not able to see the dais. May I request the media personnel to please oblige. Moving on, ladies and gentlemen, we will now present a short audio-visual clip on the transformation of Indian visa services in Bangladesh by the introduction of cashless transactions by the State Bank of India. Relations between India and Bangladesh is the result of people-to-people -people contact, which in turn is propelled by cultural and linguistic similarities, passion for arts, music, literature, an inherent preference for sports. And most importantly, IFAX set up by High Commission of India to meet the visa demand in Bangladesh. Quoting official statistics, 9.33 lakh visas were issued in the previous year. An average of 6,000 visa applications are submitted on a daily basis. Going by the trend, the number of visas issued in 2017 are expected to cross 14 lakhs. And yes, as the numbers suggest, the number of visas issued the highest for any Indian mission in the world. All of the improvements have been possible due to the concerted efforts and initiatives of High Commission of India, which includes taking IVAX to doorsteps of applicants, removing the cap on number of business and medical visa applications submission, offering free registration services 
for senior citizens and freedom fighters. Issuing visas up to a period of five years for business purpose, senior citizens and freedom fighters. Walk-in application system rolled out at Chittagong, Rajshahi and Rangpur with more IVAX to follow. Provides assistance through various digital channels like Facebook, email, call center, online application, tracking mechanism, etc. Gradual shift towards an appointment-less system. And now, drawing inspiration from the concept of Digital India and its major initiatives like cashless transactions, digital communication and support, etc., High Commission of India has envisioned the transformation of IVAX into cashless IVAX by promoting digital payments. State Bank of India, a pioneer in digital and cashless banking, has already played a crucial role in the drive for cashless economy in India. SBI, which manages IVAX, is now facilitating the High Commission's vision of cashless IVAX in Bangladesh. Enumerating on the benefits. Till now, the visa processing fee payment was enabled through only one accredited mobile financial services provider. But now onwards, we are opening all possible modes for visa processing fee payment. An applicant may make the payment using internet banking, cards or mobile wallets. There would be a reduction of 44% in waiting time at IVAX. And the payment may be made 24-7 and from any place, be it residence, office or on the move. Bangladesh boasts of 5.44 crores of mobile wallet subscribers, 1.9 crore debit or credit card holders, 36,000 POS terminals, etc. These, coupled with good internet penetration, places Bangladesh in an eminent position to accept cashless IVAX. The cashless initiatives does not stop here. State Bank of India which manages IVAX on behalf of High Commission of India has introduced SPI travel card in Bangladesh which is dollar denominated easy to carry safe and secure can be used at any POS terminal or ATM is valid for five years and is easily reloadable and contributes to cashless transactions in India. Let's now move over to the launch of cashless IVAC. Ladies and gentlemen, we now move on to the inauguration of the cashless visa scheme. This is being implemented by the State Bank of India on behalf of the High Commission of India. We will now take you to one of our largest India visa application center at Shamoli in Dhaka. I now request the Minister of Finance and Corporate Affairs of India, His Excellency, Mr. Arun Jaitley, to kindly launch the cashless visa services at Shamuli, Dhaka. A big round of applause. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you, sir. We will now take you over to our largest Indian visa application center at Shamoli, Dhaka. We have before us the first visa applicant under the new scheme, Ms. Kamroon 
नाहर You can now see on the screen the receipt being generated and handed over to the applicant. This amply demonstrates the simplicity and efficiency of the cashless transaction process. Thank you, Kamrun. We now take you over to the Indian Visa Application Center in Sylhet, where we have the first visa applicant, Masmud Misfa Begum, waiting for submission of her visa application form. We are getting connected to Silet. I may mention here that Silet, located in northeastern Bangladesh, is the home of home and parliamentary constituency of His Excellency Mr. A. M. A. Mohit, the Finance Minister of Bangladesh. We have we have been connected to Silet. Musmad Misfa Begum, she is submitting her application form. You can see on the screen that the receipt is being generated and handed over to the applicant. This model Indian visa application center has been recently refurbished to make it user friendly and to maximize efficiencies. If you like what you see of the Silet IVAC, we will propose remodeling of all our other 11 Indian visa application centers in Bangladesh on similar lines. The cashless visa scheme is being simultaneously launched in all the 12 Indian visa application centers. So we can see on the screen that the receipt has been generated and Masmood is holding it. The cashless visa scheme is being simultaneously launched in all the 12 Indian visa application centers in Bangladesh. The process is expected to reduce transaction time in the visa application process by as much as 44%, thereby increasing the number of visas that can be issued within the existing capacities and providing for ease of convenience for the applicant. Ladies and gentlemen, we now move on to the inauguration of the representative office of the Exim Bank of India in Dhaka. May I now request the Managing Director of Exim Bank of India, Mr. David Ruskina, to briefly introduce the Exim Bank of India's involvement 
in Bangladesh. So, please. Your Excellencies, the respected finance ministers of India and Bangladesh, His Excellency the High Commissioner, distinguished ministers, senior officials of the governments of India and Bangladesh, dignitaries from industry, ladies and gentlemen. As a corporation owned and established by the Government of India, Exim Bank is privileged to be the instrument of the Government of India in its economic diplomacy through the lines of credit, which in the case of Bangladesh aggregate close to 8 billion US dollars, the largest single such recipient. Exim Bank is also privileged to have provided a credit facility of 1.6 billion US dollars for the construction of the Maitri power project here in Bangladesh. Recognizing the importance of this relationship and the growing economic ties, Exim Bank is privileged to have its representative office here in Dhaka notched and inaugurated at the hands of the Honorable Finance Ministers. It is our privilege to have this office launched by the two Finance Ministers and sir, we would be grateful to have your inspiration for this particular office. We will request both Finance Ministers to please come forward. We now take you over on screen to the Dhaka representative office of the Exim Bank of India. Over to Exim Bank Dhaka. We are not able to hear you. Thank you, Honorable Finance Ministers and the dignitaries on the dais for inaugurating Exim Bank's Dhaka office. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure and honor to invite the Finance Minister of Bangladesh, His Excellency Mr. AMA Mohit, to kindly address us. Your Excellency, Mr. Arun Jatli, distinguished visitors from India, cabinet ministers, my colleagues, and high officials of the government of Bangladesh and also the government of India, and a very large attendance of top businessmen of India and whatever we could also try to get from Bangladesh. Best wishes to you. It's no longer time to say good morning. It's now good afternoon. Good noon. I don't have much to say because we are all waiting to listen to Mr. Jetley. Only thing I would like to say is this that Bangladesh began its independent existence in 1971. In the early period, it needed a great deal of imports to be financed by foreign assistance. When this period was slightly changing, there came the big problem of adjustment. And for many years, we only talked about adjustment. Adjustment to an economy to the changing circumstances of the world. Then, later, we began to realize that what is very important for the development of a country is its macroeconomic stability. There is a wonderful a statement on macroeconomic development in the World Bank report of 1981, where they try to identify what is macroeconomic development, what are the elements which should be taken into consideration when you are trying to maintain equilibrium in your 
National League. Now, well, I'm not going to talk about it because you will hear immediately about it. All that I'm saying is there are phases through which international development has passed through. And that began probably with the use of the, uh, uh, what is it, the pump, water pump of white in the early, late 18th century. No, late 17th century. And then it has taken years and years for us to go forward. But then, the revolution that we, that we experienced recently in the 80s on ICT, uh, Information and Communication, Communication Technology, that has made a tremendous difference. The fast pace of progress now is unbelievable. And what is more important to me, and perhaps to our colleagues in India, is that ICT, in my view, is one of the strongest instruments to eliminate corruption. We saw payments. We, we also have arrangements for receipts. And this introduction of just payments and receipts in this country, in some areas, have brought down the cost of doing business by 75%. What it means is 75%, large part of it was corruption. That is totally eliminated. Well, I don't think I'm going to say anything more. I would uh, request, uh, of course, she will do her duty, but I take the responsibility to request the Honorable Finance Minister of India, whom I had known by name for quite a long time, but I didn't have a chance to meet him till he assumed the office of the Minister of Finance and also of many other ministries, you see. You can see from what you have heard about his career that he is one of the most outstanding persons in India and certainly the most outstanding lawyer. Uh, and lawyers always pick with arguments. We, are, we should be having a good time now in seeing how arguments can really sustain macroeconomic development. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir, for your, for your kind words. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the moment we have all been waiting for. I now request the Honorable Minister of Finance and Corporate Affairs of India, His Excellency Mr. Arun Jaitley, to address us on the subject of macroeconomic initiatives of the Government of India. Thank you, sir. His Excellency, the Honorable Minister for Finance, Bangladesh, India's High Commissioner to Bangladesh, other distinguished dignitaries on the dais, Honorable Ministers, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. Let me at the very outset thank the Government of Bangladesh and the Honorable Minister for Finance for having extended us a very warm hospitality during the visit of the Indian delegation to Bangladesh. We are witnessing an era where India and Bangladesh have built up a relationship over the years which is now climaxing. There is uh, 
a very significant cooperation and understanding between the two governments, between the people of the two countries. The very fact that the High Commissioner mentioned just now that 1.4 million people from Bangladesh visit India every year. This is the largest any country sends to India. And of course, the kind of discussion we've had today, where we've extended uh, our third line of credit to Bangladesh, which is the largest ever on the most favorable terms that we have give, ever given to any country, and which is the largest ever that Bangladesh has received, only indicates uh, the level of trust between the two countries which has now developed. Our roots are of common origin. Our people and their attitudes are very similar. And therefore, I take it uh, a lot of our challenges also are very much common in nature. I deal with the micro and the macroeconomic initiatives a little later. But the second part of the subject about our initiatives in taking India to a more cashless direction, perhaps a more appropriate word would have been taking India towards a lesser caste direction. Even though Indian economy has grown over the last several years and grown quite rapidly, the last three years have seen us as the fastest growing major economy in the world. But one of the great challenges uh, in Indian economy that we always faced was that it was a cash-centric economy. And therefore, from the very first day when the government under the present Prime Minister, Sri Narendra Modi, had taken over, step by step, initiatives were taken which moved in the direction of making India a less cash economy. In the year 2014, we discovered that though we had a very large banking network in India, only about 58% of Indians or Indian families were connected to a banking system. There were 42% which were completely outside the financial inclusion fold. And therefore, the very first challenge before the government was, how do we bring in these 42% into the banking fold? These were people in rural areas. These were people in the tribal areas. These were people in geographically more remote areas. These were also people in some parts of central India, which were impacted by left-wing extremism. And therefore, the challenge of reaching every home was a challenge which was accepted by India's banking system. Led predominantly by the public sector banks, and of course, the private sector banks also cooperated in this whole process. In a period of next several weeks, on a Michel Mold, a campaign was undertaken to visit every household. Banking correspondents, representatives of banks visited every home and ensured that every family tries to open a bank account. And if you look around this uh, room, you'll find a number of uh, billboards and therefore the first one that you see on your left and my right 
in Hindi reads the Pradhan Mantri Janadhan Yojana. It's the Janadhan program. This was the program for a financial inclusion. And we were able to open 300 million, 30 crore bank accounts. India approximately with a population of about 125 crores has about 25 or 26 crore families. And therefore, 30 crore new bank accounts were opened. And when these opened up, almost 70% of them, 78% of them to be precise, did not have a single rupee on them. There were zero balance accounts. So the rules were attended, amended to allow a zero balance amount. In order to incentivize people to keep holding these bank accounts, some incentives were provided and the incentives were in the nature of very low cost insurance and pension policies. Like most developing countries, India also is an underinsured, underpensioned society. And therefore, for a nominal premium of one rupee a month. Each one of these people were told that you will, can have a, a rupees two lakh accident pension policy. For a 12 rupee a month, you could have a two lakh life insurance policy. And literally millions and millions of people started subscribing to these policies. Each one of them was given the facility of having a rupee debit card. They were given an overdraft facility depending on the operability of the account of some nominal amount of money that they could borrow from the banks. Once this network of financial inclusion was completed, came the second challenge, how do you put more monies into these bank accounts. Obviously, a very large number of these people were extremely poor to have resources of their own. Now, we have at the level of the central government, the state government, and the third tier of governments, several support systems which are given to the government, to the, to the poor people. Now, these are in form of subsidies. Originally, all subsidies were given in terms of subsidized prices. And the challenge of subsidized prices was that these subsidies became a support system which anyone could get, including people who didn't deserve these subsidies. Subsidies normally become uh, an amount which is given to an unidentified section of people. For instance, all cooking gas in India was subsidized. All petrol, all diesel was subsidized. And therefore, obviously, the consumers of this product were naturally the more affluent people. And these subsidies were also flowing to the more affluent people. How do these subsidies get targeted? And therefore, we've had uh, a program which has become unique to India, which is known as the Aadhaar number or the unique identity number. Every Indian today has to get a unique identity number, which also has his fingerprints, his uh, other biometric details. And therefore, an identification of every Indian was possible. This was given a statutory support by a legislation of parliament and therefore these subsidies then using the strength had to reach his bank account. Now three sets of data is being integrated into one. You had the bank account number, you had the unique identity number, and you had over a 100 crore mobile telephones. So this trinity of Janadhan, 
Aadhaar and mobile, which is called Jam, which is now being integrated into a database, is used to identify who these poor people were. As a result of which, we are now undertaking a huge campaign in which all support systems, instead of being given in terms of subsidized prices, are now given by a cash transfer. Everybody buys his products at the market price, but the poor and the deserving have a certain amount of money transferred to their bank accounts. The effect of which is that most of these Janadana accounts became operationable. And therefore, where we started with uh, about 78% zero ba balance accounts, today we have less than 20% which are zero balance accounts. Most of them are being operated either on the strength of their own resources or on the strength of whatever support system has been put into these bank accounts. Now, this process having been undertaken, the next step has been, which is very similar to the microfinancing systems that you have in various countries, including Bangladesh. Under the mudra scheme, the banks, to all forms of entrepreneurs who needed small loans, and had to depend on money lenders at exorbitant prices, have now trans started transferring to literally hundreds of millions of people loans at very reasonable rates, which help them to generate a lot of uh, economic activity. Now, once this infrastructure of the banking system connectivity to the accounts is completed. We had the second major challenge as far as the Indian economy is concerned, which is a high cash economy. 86% of all currency in India was high denominational currency. Not only was it high denominational currency, as a percentage of our GDP, almost 12.5% of uh, GDP was the size of the cash currency in operation. And therefore, a very large part of India's economy just thrived on cash. And when you thrive on cash, the curse of cash also hits you. Cash leads to tax evasion. Cash leads to shadow economy. Cash leads to corruption. Cash leads to various other evils that can strike a system itself. And in fact, excessive cash operates against the poor. Because it's the man who's in possession of excessive cash is able to deprive the state of its revenue which otherwise would be used for the benefit of the economically deprived. Cash also has an anonymity when it operates in the market. Nobody knows who the owner of this cash is. And in countries like India, we've seen uh, a lot of terror activities thriving and supporting on the strength of that cash. And therefore, the society needed to be shaken where you can't buy a property without a substantial part of money being paid in cash. It was difficult to operate businesses till you didn't operate two sets of account books. And therefore, not much had been done in the past. The government, in the first instance, gave an opportunity to people to pay higher amounts of tax and if there was any asset outside the country, to bring it back. And if they didn't bring it back on pay payment of penal tax, a strong law has been enacted. The second stage was, we came out with an income disclosure scheme. We then came out with the, a Benami law, which means 
properties held in the name of fake non-existent parties, but actually owned by somebody else. This was made a criminal offence, and these properties are liable to be confiscated. And thereafter came the final decision of the Prime Minister, where on the 8th of November 2016, he announced a demonetization of the high-value currency. So the high denominational currency was demonetized and people were compelled to deposit whatever they were holding into the banking system. By this very act, the anonymity which was attached to the cash was over. The owner of that cash per se had to go and declare that money into the banking system. People tried to find ways of getting around it. But we have a very robust uh, IT mechanism which pierced through this system. The very fact that it gets deposited in the money, in the bank, it doesn't become a legitimate acquisition. You have to show the original source of acquisition is a valid one. And we've already been able to identify 1.8 million people whose deposits were completely disproportionate to their incomes. And therefore, they are having to answer the law itself. As a result of this, we've seen some important changes. The quantum of cash currency has been squeezed in the society, even post-demonetization. Now that remonetization is complete, we have less cash operating. The number of digitalized transactions have increased. And the number of income tax pays in India has suddenly increased. Because those whom cash kept outside the tax system have been compelled to now come within the tax system. And the fourth very important gain has been, both in areas of left-wing extremism and in Kashmir, the terrorists have been squeezed of their cash funding. And therefore, there is a sudden dip in the kind of protest and the nature of protest that they used to organize. Now, coupled with this, we have making a, a very significant change in our taxation system itself. We've introduced the goods and services tax. These are early days of implementation of that goods and services tax. It has a very robust uh, IT mechanism supporting it. And therefore, we find initially there is a lot of space for improvement uh, as far as that tax structure itself is complete. We are all open to making those changes. But this new tax system, which brings the entire chain of economic activity into one tax structure in the country, is also increasingly making cash generation a lot more difficult. And the impact of this is to, in the long run and the medium run, going to be to expand the size as far as the Indian economy is concerned, make it a cleaner GDP, and eventually make it a much bigger GDP, which has been the intention as far as the government of India is concerned. We made several other reforms. We are rationalizing our direct taxes. We have a robust uh, FDI policy. We invite in uh, all kinds of investments into the country. We are rationalizing our direct taxes. We are reducing the interaction between the assessing officer and the assessee itself. We've almost eliminated corruption as far as central government is concerned by ending all discretions in economic decision making. All resources are now distributed through an IT platform, through a market mechanism. And I'm quite sure that in the long and the medium run, this is continuing to allow Indian economy to grow much faster and grow much greener. This is, I think, the future direction of Indian economy itself is going to be. I'm sure my friends uh, in the policy research department here will make a close study of this. And probably there, there are several areas to research 
and understand and maybe in some other countries to emulate out of this. I thank you very much uh, for having provided me that opportunity to, to, to elaborate on this cashless or the less cash phenomena that we've been attempting in India. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for your most enlightening speech, which I'm sure the audience has greatly appreciated. May I now request the chairman of the Policy Research Institute of Bangladesh, Mr. Zaidi Sattar, to summarize today's proceedings in his concluding remarks. Sir. Thank you. His Excellency, Mr. Jaitley, Minister of Finance and Corporate Affairs, Government of India, Honorable A.M. Muhit, <coughs> MP, Minister of Finance of Bangladesh, His Excellency, Mr. Harshavardhan Singhla, High Commissioner of India, Honorable Ministers and former Ministers of Government of Bangladesh, distinguished members of the business community, academia, and research institutions, members of the print and electronic media, ladies and gentlemen. It is an honor and a distinct privilege to be able to make some concluding remarks following the speech of His Excellency, the Finance and Corporate Affairs Minister of India. We at PRI are deeply humbled and thankful for this opportunity to partner with the Indian High Commission for this August event. I was uh, told that the Honorable uh, Minister, Finance Minister of India would be speaking extempore, and so there was some uh, uh, you know, gap in understanding exactly what he would be saying, but uh, the title of the um, event showed that he would be speaking on the macroeconomic initiatives uh, of the government of India. And uh, as a uh, research institute that uh, works on economic policy issues, uh, we thought we had you know, some uh, comments to make on, on those uh, uh, initiatives. And of course, we always have some messages uh, for uh, our friends in India as to how we could uh, accelerate the, uh, the friendship and the, the common bonds between the, two, the people of the two countries. So I, I can understand that uh, one of the things that he pointed out was about India moving towards a cashless society. India, as far as we know, uh, India is riding a digital wave. India leads, uh, is, is a leading um, you know, country when it comes to uh, digitization of activities. And he, does, he did describe uh, the fact that this cashless uh, society that India is looking forward to will also bring a cleaner uh, economy, uh, which he terms as a a cleaner GDP and a much larger GDP. Uh, obviously, uh, uh, the cashless society and IT dominate, IT determined society also is uh, going to be less, uh, we'll see less corruption and therefore one hopes to see, um, you know, the tax system working, functioning more uh, efficiently and generating more revenues for the government. If I may uh, add some of the, the other things that we were expecting on the macroeconomic uh, parts, may I uh, add that India has been the fastest growing G20 economy for the past three years, growth averaging 7.5% annually. Uh, thanks to the recent deregulation measures, which he mentioned, an acceleration of structural reforms, which provided strong growth impetus. 
Today, the Indian economy is showing some signs of a slowdown, uh, perhaps a reflection of sluggish growth across the world. But as we heard from the Honorable Minister and, uh, uh, and some of his speeches that we've seen in, in India, uh, the government is up to the task uh, to shore up the Indian economy and restore high growth, which is good news for Bangladesh. We hope the slowdown is temporary and the macroeconomic pump priming that is taking place will be effective and longer lasting. Uh, we are aware that the GST uh, that has been successfully implemented despite populist resistance from certain quarters and the remaining teething problems will be sorted out in due course. Bangladesh can learn from India on how to get good policies implemented despite populist resistance. We believe that a high-performing Indian economy complemented by prudent but expansionary macroeconomic policies could offer an external stimulus to the Bangladesh economy by creating additional demand for goods and services and giving a boost to our exports. Since uh, of the five aspects of pump priming, India's export stimulus may help boost our imports from India. But since 75 to 80 percent of our imports from India are intermediate and capital goods that fit into our manufacturing sector, that is good for job and growth. As for capital guzzling expenditures on infrastructure, that is part of the, the PRUM priming initiative, uh, some focus on upscaling India-Bangladesh transport and trade infrastructure could be to our mutual benefit from improved connectivity and trade facilitation. India, after all, is Bangladesh's largest trading partner when we consider trade in goods as well as services. Official merchandise trade between the two countries uh, reached $7.4 billion in fiscal 2017, making up a quarter of South Asian trade of $28 billion. But that is not all. The bulk of the trade in services is informal, with only modest official figures for trade in healthcare, education, and tourism services. Then there is a significant flow of migrant workers, with the World Bank reporting bilateral remittance flows of $4.5 billion in 2016. Taken all together, formal and informal services and merchandise trade, official and unofficial, we conservatively estimate bilateral trade of the order of 12 to 15 billion dollars, perhaps more. And that is why we, we consider India to be our largest trading partner. But there are certain problems that remain. Although trade is growing fast and bilateral relations are going, growing and the economies are getting more integrated. Uh, because there's more investment flows and bilateral approaches to substantial investment in energy and transport connectivity, complemented by removal of many regulatory barriers. All this augurs well for the future prosperity of the 1.4 billion people in these two countries, millions of whom could be lifted out of poverty as a consequence of these bilateral initiatives. And that is all good news. Uh, Pre-1947, the entire South Asia region was one integrated economy, with 34% of its global trade happening within the region. Sadly, that is now down to a mere 5 to 6%, leading global analysts to suggest that South Asia is the least integrated region in the world. A big part of the regional integration problem stems from the lack of connectivity. While the will of our people is reflected in political divisions, in these modern times of unfettered movement of data and ideas across the digital highway, it seems outlandish to live with such fragmented trade and transport infrastructure defined only by political borders. That simply raises the transaction costs of doing business, serves as barriers to movement of goods and people, quite apart from imposing financial burden on the poor. Since India is our second largest source of imports, the burden of such high transaction costs falls preponderantly on Bangladesh's poor. Um, 
Finally, I would be remiss if I did not mention the plight of the Rohingya refugees, which is as much an economic challenge for Bangladesh as it is a humanitarian crisis unraveling in our eastern border. Uh, we strongly feel that our good neighbor India could leverage her global influence and diplomatic might to effectuate a just and lasting resolution to the crisis as part of India's Act East policy. In concluding, PRI expects that the macroeconomic initiatives taken by the Indian government will yield positive results, not only for the Indian economy, but will also have positive spillover effects on the Bangladesh economy, given that India is Bangladesh's largest trading partner, broadly defined. Thank you again for being with us and giving us a patient hearing. Okay. Uh, uh, as our Honorable Finance Minister told us, Mr. Arun Jetli is a distinguished uh, lawyer, but when he spoke to us about, you know, these uh, subsidies and how uh, the cash, um, you know, in, instead of subsidies, it, he sounded like a real, um, uh, you know, solid uh, economist. Uh, making uh, the point about uh, subsidies. Now, I think uh, one of the things that I understood from uh, your point is that uh, earlier the subsidy that you were providing was based on the price, uh, subsidized prices. So they were getting lower prices uh, and instead you've now moved into providing cash uh, instead of uh, the prices. Now, uh, the problem there is, you know, if, if you cannot identify, if you, it, it, the challenge is to identify the, the actual um, people who deserve those subsidies. And th if you have a competent and uh, a very effective bureaucracy, uh, that is not going to be a problem identifying uh, the people who, the deserving people. However, uh, um, if the bureaucracy and the delivery mechanism is not efficient, uh, the chances are, there are strong chances that a cash source of subsidy replacing the market price mechanism uh, would end up with a lot of issues there. Now, of course, the movement towards the cashless society would take care of that problem. So the cashless, uh, moving to a cashless mechanism uh, if you can round up, if you can get more of your population um, using cashless mechanisms, that, that would be a better delivery system that I, I can think of. So we hope that uh, your system works and we have a lesson to learn from, from India's practices because we have similar issues in Bangladesh. And uh, we would also like to move into cashless environment because that's what the, the future lies, and we hope that India's digital revolution will also have some focus uh, on Bangladesh's youth, talented youth, and it's a win-win it's a cooperation that we can think of in the future. Thank you. Well, thank you very much uh, uh, for having uh, raised uh, two very important questions. Towards the end, uh, you mentioned about the experience of cashless itself. Our experience uh, of price-based subsidies has been that these are all unquantified amounts which are then transferred to an unidentified section of people. For instance, in cooking gas subsidy or a petroleum subsidy, even I was getting it. And I'm certainly not entitled to it. And therefore, you had to identify the section of people. So whether it is pensions, whether it is uh, the rural wages earned 
under our rural employment scheme or it is scholarships for weaker sections or it is any state government support system which is given or it's a college fee being given to some student or maybe a food subsidy uh, in some cases or a kerosene subsidy which is given for cooking gas cooking kerosene to some weaker sections now these are innumerable number of support systems which are given and once you are able through this trinity of the janadhan account and the uh, uh, the aadhar number you are able to identify the account into which these go and once you are able to identify the account in which you know go you find money is being transferred in the hands of bank accounts people are entitled to put them to user monies which are lost uh, to middlemen in the transit or in the distribution system that loss doesn't take place and therefore it's a far more effective delivery system the state exchequer also has been able to save literally crores of rupees thousands of crores of rupees we we were giving scholarships to people who were not born we were giving pensions to people who were long dead and this is the structure of an unidentified group to whom you give it and therefore it's really an experiment which seems to be doing much better in india regarding the initial observation you made you right uh, i was concentrating on the less cash character and the reforms which have been made on the macro economic front as far as india is concerned and as an economist that was obviously a point of key concern to you you see a few years ago india which was conventionally post our reform program in 1991 doing quite well i think we started suffering from lack of structural changes and therefore within the country and outside we were being referred to as policy paralysis and so on and we got struck up in various collateral problems and therefore it was extremely important that a second generation of reforms be brought about in the country which are in the direction of strength eventually strengthening our microeconomic base itself and i think uh, i indicated one or two of them but if i could indicate a few more to you our first and primary object was to step up investment into the country now public investment has substantially increased for instance we are spending now the central government about 4 lakh crores on physical infrastructure each year our public sector units are going to be spending this year another 3 lakh crores on public infrastructure we have opened up our fdi policy we have in fact removed some of the redundant conditions we we even remove the foreign investment promotion board 95% of all investment that comes into india is now automatic only 5% of it is regulated through the relevant ministries and we are the largest recipient of uh, fdi anywhere in the world today these two important investments have actually kept our growth rate at a reasonable level we had a second problem which was in terms of very complicated procedures environmental clearances investment related clearances we've tried to smoothen them out our third problem and in fact our predecessor government suffered from it that there was a discretionary method of allocation of resources so whether it is mineral or it's coal and we are a mineral rich country in some areas or spectrum we got bogged down in controversies because you used discretions and uh, 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 subjective criteria now we eliminated that procedure altogether and made a fair transparent non arbitrary mechanism and therefore stayed away from discretions that helped in bringing down corruption substantially 
I have announced a roadmap to bring down the corporate tax rate down to 25% in order to make sure that more money is investable. To the small and medium scale in the manufacturing sector, we've already done that. The direct tax reform, which I have just indicated, indirect tax reform, the GST, from the 1st of July, it's taken, up, oh, we are, uh, taken off. We are in the third month of our implementation. It's done reasonably well to start off. There are uh, some areas where it needs an improvement, and we are again meeting, and we continuously review it to make changes so that the adjustment uh, is quite smooth itself. Uh, it's a far easier process. We've decentralized our funding. Our states and regions today are much better off financially than they ever was. 42% of all that central government gets is devolved to the states itself. Additionally, the states have their own income. So the states uh, which do a lot of spending for poverty alleviation programs today are economically more affluent uh, themselves. In the last uh, one, one and a half years, some of these changes we brought about, for instance, uh, up, if you ask me today, what is your big challenge? And you refer to the fact uh, that having remained, uh, uh, our inflation is broadly under control, our fiscal deficits are under control, our current account deficits are under control, our infrastructure creation programs are going on at a reasonably fast pace. Our uh, national highway program is a highly successful one. We've become power surplus. We've uh, been expanding our port capacities. We are now in the process of modernizing our airports at a very substantial pace, which is already now visible. We are taking up a similar program with regard to Indian railways. So there's a lot of investment going into infrastructure itself. The second area where a lot of investment concentration is taking place is rural India because there is a huge amount of disparity. And therefore, as far as rural India is concerned, we now have a target over the next few years. For instance, every Indian village is being connected through a regular Paka road. That program is almost near completion. It will be over by next, next year, or 2019 is the target date. Every Indian village has been electrified. Out of the 600,000 odd villages, uh, we have about 3,000 left which are not uh, electrified, but which I think by the end of this year or early next year will be done. The Prime Minister has now announced a new program that within an electrified village, how many houses are there which don't have electricity? So by end of next year, we have to target individual houses itself. We have an extremely large uh, sanitation program going on. How do we provide a toilet to each home? at state expenditure. Regular houses uh, in villages and in urban areas for the poor people who don't have them. This is a part of the social drive itself. Now, where, do our, where does our growth process stand here? And what are the problems and the challenges that we face? There are two important challenges that we face. The first is, that in India, even though public investment and FDI has picked up substantially, private investment in that big way is yet to pick up. And one of the reasons is during the boom period, we had uh, a lot of expansion of capacities and you still have lack of demand and those capacities are not, not fully utilized. You also have a problem of uh, public sector banks which have unacceptable level of NPAs. And that's a, that's a top priority item which we are currently in the process of addressing. You'll hear more from us uh, in days to come itself. Now, this has reduced the, the capital inadequacy, has reduced the lending capacity of the banks itself to support growth. So this is the area of challenge which we need to address. Now, on growth rates, uh, much has been said we had, when you make structural changes, for instance, when you make a change like the GST, we announced on the 1st of July that the GST will come into force, a new tax regime will come. So obviously for a month or two around that period, 
there will be destocking of existing stocks. So the manufacturing will stock and, and people would start uh, re releasing existing stocks so that they get rid of the stocks before the new system takes over. Now that led to a certain dip amongst other factors. And I think it's transient. We'll probably, the latest data for the last month shows that we've started picking up again. And I'm sure uh, 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 we, we'll be back to whatever are our own reasonable uh, levels of growth itself. I see economic activity in India improving in the months to come itself. Thank you. Thank you, sir. On behalf of the High Commission of India and the Policy Research Institute of Bangladesh, I take this opportunity to thank the Minister of Finance and Corporate Affairs of India, His Excellency Mr. Arun Jaitley, the Minister of Finance uh, of Bangladesh, His Excellency Mr. A. M. A. Mohit. I would also like to thank the esteemed guests for joining us today and for making this event such a resounding success. Padra Mohila O Mahadaya Gan, aaj keer ei onushthan uposthit onushthane uposthito thakar jonne, ebang shafollo mondito korar jonne, apna der shobai ke ashongko dhono baad janaein. Ladies and gentlemen, we now come to the close of this event, and I wish you a very pleasant afternoon. Thank you.